get us going with that. Oh. So officially, welcome everyone to the SATAA uh, webinar um, presented by uh, Tim. Uh, we're very excited to have you today to share your, your knowledge and your insight. Um, so TIN is a TSTN organization, and um, so TIN, as I read, um, it's my first time getting to actually meet you in person, but uh, so you work as an independent educator, you're a business coach and an, an organizational consultant um, for national and international groups and organizations. Um, so I'm going to very quickly hand over the baton to yourself so you can give us a more real introduction of what, what it is you do and what you're going to be doing with us today. Over to you. Thank you, Andrew. And I, I just wanted to correct one thing. I'm not a TSTA in organization, but a PTSTA. Yeah. So I feel, I feel yeah, it's, a, it's a good permission, Andrew, to, to continue that road, yeah? <laughs> which I'm currently on. And um, thank you so much for inviting me. And it's a pleasure to, to meet you all. And this is why I really love Zoom and online, although I don't work that much online, but it's a great opportunity to meet people from all over the world. And, um, and, and today, a lot of people that I get to meet from, uh, from the South African uh, TA Association, which is really great. Um, I live in between Brussels and Antwerp, for those who know Belgium a little bit. It's in the Flanders part, the northern part, and like Andrew said, I am a self-employed uh, trainer and um, coach. And uh, on my on my journey to TA, but I'm not going to talk about that uh, today. And so um, I just want to say that if ever I speak too fast or too slowly, or if it's incomprehensible or anything you would like to to that I'm more clear about, please do not hesitate to raise your hands. Uh, you can also ask questions by raising hands or put them in the chat and uh, Kirsty and Andrew will help me uh, to make sure that none gets forget forgotten uh, throughout the throughout this time. Yeah, so um, and um, we're going to have a, a little bit of an, a webinar workshop because we are also going to do an exercise in the breakout room. Um, but I'm going to share some slides and I will obviously make them available to you all afterwards. Uh, by sending them and um, maybe it's a good idea when we do an exercise that you just take a screenshot or a photo of the of the part that is asked but I will repeat it and um, yeah it's also good to to if ever you want to raise something do so because when I'm in PowerPoint mode I cannot see you very well I can see you all in a small on a small part and as you all know you can use the slider in the middle of your screen it's this line between the the little pictures and the PowerPoint, so you can adjust that to have your more uh, to have a best best view. And um, I don't know if there are any anthropologists actually in this group. Are there any? No. Good. Me neither. <laughs> but I I just want to explain a little bit why I am uh, so um, so curious uh, about this this topic because. Um, anthropology has always fascinated me in the sense that I love history and uh, as a social scientist I also like people and I, I sort of made from my hobby in being a trainer and working with groups my, my, uh, my work, my professional work and I am fascinated by how people behave in groups and in themes. And when we say anthropology, and of course we will explore a bit further, um, I, I got a sense that when I got to know TA that for me, Eric Byrne is also sort of an anthropologist. Um, he must have been a keen observer. If you remember how he used to um, interrogate or ask questions to young people who were to, who were to become soldiers, and he immediately sort of could could have an analysis of them. And so he was, he was cognitive, very wise, obviously, but also a keen observer of interactions and how people behave with each other. And this has, has fascinated me. And the other part um, of why I like it so much is that he, he talks a lot about, about Martians, you know, to adopt 
the the idea of the Martian, and you obviously all, all have heard of that, I suppose, is that can we look with fresh eyes at individuals? Can we look at without any bias, without any judgments uh, towards people? And so this this Martian idea for me is also very compatible with the anthropological mindset. And um, and so this was this was also something that I, I really wanted to to underline. And for me, anthropology is also about getting to know people, getting the humanness of people, uh, just beyond everything that we stick to it in corporations or in, in, in organizations, etc. And so I hope that today we can we can explore a bit uh, further on that. But since we are not such a big group, um, and it's not only going to be one way, I hope, I was just curious to not have a too long uh, um, how to say that, meet and greet or contact, but I, I, I just would like to ask you one question, just uh, maybe stating your name and maybe saying, um, what is your favorite TA concept? You know, some, a few words, a few sentences of, of, of what, what is it that, that, that attracts you so much, so much in TA? So um, and maybe for practica practical reasons, I'll just go around my screen and I'll just say a name and then you can just uh, say something so that we have a little bit of contact in any in any way. Is that okay for everybody? Yeah, cool. Thank you. So uh, let me start with Mary. Hi, Mary. Hi. <laughs> um, so what was the first question? Where am I based? Is that right? Or sure, you can say that too. All oh, right. Okay. Uh, what you love in TA. All oh, right. Okay. So I'm I'm in Glasgow in Scotland, and. Um, I have, I'm a coach as well. And so I guess a couple of tools I find really helpful from TA are the drama triangle and the winner's triangle. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, really great. We all get into them. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> as human beings. Let me, let me go to Roya. Um, hi, Roya. It's really nice to see you again. Hi, Jen. So I'm Roya Liverpool and I'm joining from The Hague in the Netherlands. Um, I am also a coach and a counselor. I use NLP and TA in my work with clients. And the things I love about uh, TA is uh, the uh, notion of the life script, uh, as I love storytelling and the whole idea of the fact that we are living by a story we constructed when we were even less than seven fascinates me. I also love strokes and drivers. Great, yeah, thank you so much. And this is also how I know you, Raya, We're giving strokes all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to Yannis. Is that is that the correct pronunciation? But I'm seeing a John as well. <laughs> yes. Hello, everybody. I'm John. I'm from Athens, Greece. I'm a psychologist and I'm working as a psychotherapist, as trainer. And uh, from the end, my favorite concept is the script and how to turn from loser script to banal or winner. Great. Thank you, John. Yeah, this is the core concept, would Burns say, huh? the script. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me go over to Diane, please. Hello, um, I'm Diane Salters living down in Cape Town. I'm PSTA psychotherapy, and I think if I had to choose one favorite, because there's so many, I would go to the absolute basics, which is ego states. That's my favorite. Thank you. Great. And I hope to also make a connection with that, because this is obviously where the interaction between people is, is going on. Yes. Thank you, Diane. Leo, please. Sorry. Hi, <laughs> I'm Nayo, and I'm also in Cape Town in South Africa, so not very far away from Diane. And I think, hi, I think my favorite TA concept is the windows of the world. Um, so yeah, especially focusing on I'm okay, you're okay, and how 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 can I get to do that and and look through that window the most? Great, yes, and. Uh... Yeah, looking out windows here, it's okay. We had a hot summer, but this is not <laughs> what you mean, eh? Lyo. And thank no. you. I noticed your name is pronounced Lyo, and I yes. did it. Lyo. Yeah. So, but um, great because it's frames of references, obviously, eh? is yes. uh, so important. Yeah, to share also. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. 
Let's go to Neil. I can't see you, Neil, but I suppose you are there. Um, I am. I'm sorry. I don't know if my camera is set up. Can you see it now? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, my name is Neil Budko. Um, I feel like a bit of a gate crash here, but um, I'm living in Johannesburg and I'm a senior lecturer in pharmacology at the University of Advertisrand. And um, I was introduced to TA by Sharon Kalenko. We still do quite a lot of work together, but I thought I'd take a dive into this. And my favorite concept is the P1A1C1 in the um, child that's uh, developing. Mm, the structural model. Wow. Mm, mm. I'm definitely no specialist in that because I hardly know <laughs> Work. And unfortunately, Neil, we cannot go into that today, but maybe no, it's okay. Okay. Share because I'm very curious also to that. Thank you, Neil. And I'll go to Puja. Puja, I know, don't know exactly how you pronounce it. Hello. Oh, hi. Uh, yeah, you, you got my name right. Um, uh, so my favorite concept is uh, ego states and transactions proper uh, uh, from there. So, uh, yeah. So that that is uh, that's always got my attention. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward uh, to the Great. session. Okay. And if, if you if you can, you can put your camera on. I don't know if it is possible technically or not, uh, because it's always easier or nicer also to see some faces. But just do it uh, what what is comfortable for you also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, I, I'm just having a bit of technical issues, but uh, if that's sorted, I'll, I will be on camera. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then let's go to Evelyn. Oh, she's got, no, she can't speak at the moment. She's doing more busier things. So let's go to Kirsty then. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, so I'm Kirsty and this is Evelyn. Um, we are in Cape Town and life coach, uh, working on my CPA very slowly. Um, my favorite concept are the drama triangle, which was the first one I ever came across. Um, and also functional ego states I find particularly useful. Yeah. Yes, I think Drama Triangle was the first one I read about also in a, in a book about coaching. Yeah. And I was immediately fascinated by how that goes. Thank you, Kirsty. Andrew. And thank you, by the way, Kirsty and Andrew for helping me out with uh, today. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so I'm, <clears throat> I'm based in Pretoria um, in South Africa. And um, yeah, it's a bit hard to try and narrow it down to one TA concept, um, but I think that the two that kept coming to mind was drama triangle um, and obviously the, the positive side of the winner's triangle circle. And then um, something that I've been working a lot with recently is uh, rackets and racket systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Yes. So I feel like this is like, if we put all these concepts together, we were going to have a very nice patchwork, very nice puzzle um, of, of beautiful interlinking concepts as well. I do believe that somebody else came in, but I don't see them at the moment. So I suggest that we just continue and I'm going to share some slides uh, with you. Okay, go. So I do, I do, I'm going to use some cartoons. I hope that's okay for you guys. This is not to be disrespectful. It's because I love them. They're from Gary Larson. And I think because they convey meaning sometimes in a funny and yet a very uh, meaningful way as well. So uh, we are going to, to, to see, um, we're going to talk a bit about some anthropological models that I found interesting, but please, I have no pretense whatsoever to reinvent the wheel. I am, you know, I am not going to give you um, um, new theory or, or um, I don't, I don't pretend to have the truth on anthropology. Um, so I'm just going to share some viewpoints uh, in this outline proposal of, of what I believe could be interesting to make some links with TA with, and also that I recognized in my own professional um, explorations with my, with my clients. Um, so it is, it's also based on some articles in TA and, uh, we can share some of that as well. Um, but it's, it's, it is, it is a curiosity of, of how some viewpoints, some mindsets from anthropology can also be uh, used 
in uh, the TA work. So I hope that this outline proposal is convenient for you all. And I've just to put a photo of um, two books that have been a huge inspiration for me in developing this and also in my work. And they are from uh, Jutske Kramer and Daniela Brown, two Dutch ladies. And those books have been translated actually also in English. And I'm just also at the end giving a reference uh, list, but those are the ones I found them marvelously made. Uh, they are full with, filled with beautiful pictures and with fascinating stories on, on what we can do in organizations to, um, yeah, to explore uh, cultural differences, but also to use concepts from anthropology in our modern corporate and organizational life. So I can highly, highly recommend them. And um, right, so we have been contracting a little bit on that. And um, yep, my area hope, this is, this is something I, I, I often include. It's, it's, I would love to hear in the end what you take away from it as well. Um, um, what, what touches you? And maybe you see some references to all the beautiful concepts that you've been just been talking about. And what could that mean for your practice, obviously? in the different fields, education I heard, counseling, psychotherapy, organizational, uh, that we are all busy with. So if there is nothing more to contract for, and I'm just gonna check if there's anybody raising their hands, is there anything else somebody wants to add at this moment? Not at the moment. Gia, I think you are, you just came in. Can you hear me? Gia, hello? Just wanted to welcome you also because you came in a little bit later. Um, you are muted, so I can't hear you. I guess you will show up. Uh, I see um, Adgir has uh, given us a text in the in, in chat box saying yes, hello. Okay, great, good, all right. So let's go a bit to uh, what is that actually anthropology? And this was really easy because I found a quite nice little video on YouTube for that. And I would like to share it with you guys just to give a, a, a quick view on what it is. It's not that long, it's five minutes and a half. And I propose that we just go now and take a look at that. And here it goes. And please raise your hands if there's any technical issues, but it should be okay because we have practiced that beforehand. Okay, here it comes. Welcome to the Macat Multimedia Series and to Macat's Introduction to Anthropology. Anthropology is the study of people and their cultures. Its roots stretch back more than a thousand years to exotic travelers' tales imagining strange societies and peoples whose behavior fascinated early explorers. But scholars began the serious study of human culture only late in the 19th century. Early anthropologists studied customs and beliefs in pre-industrial societies in the hope of opening windows onto their own pasts, in order to explain how institutions like religion or the family had come to be. Some of the texts that emerged during this period continue to be influential. Among them, Marcel Moss's book, The Gift, which argued that gifts, far from being free, create complex bonds of reciprocal obligation that help to underpin cultures. It was not until the early 20th century, though, that anthropology began to focus heavily on ethnography, the intensive long-term fieldwork that has become its best-known tool. Franz Boas in the United States and Bronislav Malinowski in Britain rejected much of their predecessors' work as speculation and insisted on living among the people they studied and talking to them in their own languages. The questions asked by anthropology got more ambitious too. Rather than trying to understand how institutions developed over time, scholars began to ask how they fitted together to create a functioning society this is the structural functionalist tradition, perhaps best exemplified by E. E. Evans Pritchard's Witchcraft, Oracles, and Magic, a book which demonstrated that belief in witchcraft made perfect sense when understood as a way of keeping order in society. 
Human culture is complex, and anthropology quickly developed into a number of specializations. Political anthropology questioned the assumptions of global politics, as when James Ferguson issued his challenge to the international development industry in The Anti-Politics Machine, and showed that aid is often directed to meet political goals rather than human needs. Medical anthropology explores differing experiences of medicine and disease. And Victor Turner, in The Ritual Process, explored the power of symbols through the performance of religious ceremonies. Feminist anthropology, too, has asked fundamental questions about the ways in which we understand society. Lila Abelugod wonders why Western academics see the clothes worn by Muslim women as symbols of subjugation rather than acceptance of a moral system, and why they expect Afghans to cast aside their burqas when they themselves would never wear a pair of shorts to an opera. The 1960s saw further advances in anthropological theory beginning with Claude Livy Strauss's ambitious attempts to study cultures as structures of human thought. His book, Structural Anthropology, drew on a model derived from linguistics to introduce what became known as structuralism, the theory that cultures are built on hidden underpinnings formed from human perceptions and activity, and the idea that all of these are constructs that are packed with meaning. A decade later, Clifford Gertz advanced another idea. His The Interpretation of Cultures suggested that culture should not be studied scientifically and in search of laws, but interpretively, by scholars in search of meaning. This fresh thinking forced a re-examination of much ethnographic fieldwork, but it also liberated anthropology from a focus on the reproduction of culture that had made it blind to social change. Johannes Fabian's Time and the Other provides an example of anthropologists radically rethinking the ways in which they approach the people whom they study. Fabian pointed out how easy it was to fall into the trap of writing about people as if they inhabited not just another place, but another time. His work helped to inspire the development of historical anthropology and texts like Eric Wolf's Europe and the People Without History, which gave voice to people whose stories had formerly been ignored. Today, anthropologists still seek new ways to reevaluate old problems and apply ethnographic methods to modern people in a rapidly changing and globalizing world. We'll introduce you to anthropologists past and present and to the endlessly fascinating world human culture. Come inside to find out more. Macat. Learn better. Think smarter. Aim higher. Okay. Yeah. I hope this was audible for everybody mm -hmm. and inspirational. Um, it is a vast field, obviously, uh, anthropology, and uh, because it's the study of man, it just encompasses everything around humanity. But I'm curious, just to pick up a few words from you guys to, to see what has inspired you from this little video. What were some immediate uh, thoughts or inspirations you had from that? Can we, have, can we share just a few, a few things? What stuck with you when you watched that little video? Anybody? I think what uh, struck with me was the absence of Margaret Mead, who was my original inspiration in anthropology, and I was waiting for her to appear. So I missed her. Yes, you're right. I've put a little photo of her on my conclusion, but <laughs> okay. it's true. And she was obviously a pioneer and a very important uh, carrier of the anthropology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it was just perceptions and depending what your context is, how you perceive how people dress and um, and how we overlook some of our own strange concepts in terms of dress. So people going to the opera in long gowns, but then thinking that other people and their dress is, is not perhaps the norm for them when actually they're doing something similar. That was, yeah, I find that interesting. Yes.
Yeah, I like that, Mary. And it, it reminds me of a very important concept from, from the mindset of an anthropologist, and that's the reflexivity. It's, it's, the, it's the own bias, the awareness of, of, the own bias, of the own bias, you know, like, okay, this is my window of the world, eh, uh, Layo, this is where I come from, and this is how I look at realities that mm -hmm. don't seem real for me then, maybe, and how to adjust. Yeah, great. Mm. Thank you. Anybody else? Roya, please. Um, the thing that uh, jumped at me is the picture of the African face masks. Um, and how really the design of masks has changed with time. In a way, there is an anthropology line, as you see, masks from the past and masks that are being made now. It also reminded me of my mom, who's a sociologist, and she loved collecting masks, and I like collecting masks now as well. Wow, and that is such a rich concept, a mask. You know, not only not only in anthropology, but also in psychology, sociology, and and I, I refer in my work with organizations and teams. There's obviously a lot of masks, and you see also masks in in organizations, and the masks change over time. You know, the the virtual teams. There's different masks now. The 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 way the way you enter an organization. You know how the building is constructed. It's the sort of mask. The, how people are dressed, how people, uh, what are the habits around that? So it's a very rich, rich concept. Thank you for, for reminding us. Mm. Yeah. Other points that struck you? For me, what I was also very inspired with was that um, it also touches upon intersubjectivity in the sense that there is something all underneath of that, that we all understand. There's, there's a, a common humanity uh, in that. And um, obviously in, in the TA schools of constructivism and, and, and co-creativeness and relational TA, there's a lot more to say about that. And I'm, I mean, I'm not gonna go too much into that, but this is an, a sort of a common understanding that we have as human beings. And, and I notice in my work with organizations and teams that I, I had to relearn that. I was, I was before I did TA, and I, I was working a long time already as a, as a, a consultant and, and coach in organizations and teams. And I really um, had to reinvent that world, reinvent that part, because I was much more focused on the content. And I will go a bit further into that uh, as we go along. But this was also a, a huge remembering, oh yes, bringing back the humanness, the, the universal humanity of all of it, also in organizations. And I guess that's sort of my purpose, what I'm, what I'm aiming for uh, in my professional work at the moment. So I will not go into all these great concepts of anthropology, um, like religion or artifacts or symbolism or, or uh, language or race or whatever, because it's not my field. But I just want to want to convey also my enthusiasm for, for taking some of that mindset, taking some of that, those lenses, those viewpoints with you in your professional, in your professional work. And um, I'm going to go back to the slides because I do have a few, um, okay. Yeah, so I just, you know, briefly gathered a few definitions, so to say, I mean, obviously, um, these are not exhaustive, huh? but um, anthropology, so it's also a scientific method. It has a few main fields. And uh, the one that we are going to not really look at, but make the bridge towards TA in organizational work is the cultural, social cultural anthropology. Because not only did people like Boas say that the group and not the individual is the primary concern of the anthropologists, I also believe that Byrne when he when he made his theory and when he went away from the psychoanalysis school um, he intended his theory also for psychotherapy groups because um, he thought that healing and and the quest for cure um, could be found in groups could be found in what do people among them do together and so how do we um, how do we heal each other uh, so to say so his theory was developed also in big part for groups and it's not because we behave differently in different social contexts that um, we are not isolated. We are always to be studied in social settings. And that's, that's exactly what I also do in, in teams and in groups. And so, and, and if you know that 
um social cultural obviously there's a lot to say about cultural cultural script and and group script um but it's 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 such a vast um field is such such richness to explore and everything that we see and that we encounter in social structures is meaningful and is is worthwhile investigating and um that's why i that's why i find that social or social cultural anthropology is fitting so well with corporate anthropology when you take it from a ta lens as well and i i didn't want to go into a lot of definitions but i like this one the one that's on the bottom of the slide is what is then corporate anthropology well it's translating a business question into a human one it's that simple and that complex and then of course it's the it's the investigation what exactly then is your business question what's your business about and what are the humans in that business and what's the significance of of the purpose and and how do we work together um, to realize the purpose of a corporation and I did. I did find one more uh, one more definition because I thought it was quite interesting, and I came upon a definition of a corporation as such, and I'm, I'm just going to read it. It's an association endowed by law with the rights and liabilities of an individual, and it is relating to or formed into a unified body of individuals. And I like the words that it is. Um, rights and liabilities of an individual so obviously there's always the question of how is the individual in the group how is the individual relating to the group and it is formed into a unified body of individuals and this this makes me very much aware of concepts like homogeneous cultures in organizations or uh, group think or uh, in group and out group concepts and how how is this um, linked then to an individual script, but also an organizational script, group imagos, etc. So there's so many linkages that we then can do because we have the, the all the tools uh, with uh, within TA. And I am very curious to learn more about that. And before we go into that model, I would really like to ask again a question for you all. How are you a social cultural anthropologist in using TA as a TA practitioner. So for instance, what are some of the field techniques that you use that are comparative to anthropology? Does anybody want to comment on that? Think of that from your specific professional work. I, for one, I use a lot the questionnaires, the driver's questionnaires, the working styles from Julie Hay, 2012. So I think I, I like those questionnaires because they give me an insight in the into driving behaviors and I, I can link them to the working styles. So that's that's a field technique from TA um, that I use often. Do you have examples of that as well? And you can all unmute huh, if you want to, please. <laughs> yeah, I'll go. Well, what, what I use a lot, and I think you know you all know that, well, those who know me, is the functional fluency model. Um, and in organizations, that's often a great start to looking at how do people behave with each other in the organization and how do interactions go. And, and then at, some, at first it's completely, well, we try to just observe and then the value comes in, in terms of which parts of that are effective and which parts of that are ineffective. And, and it's tricky because it, it relates with what you said earlier because there's the observation part. And as an anthropologist, we want to just observe and just see what is. But as we're doing that, there's already interpretation going on. And, and there is some form of judgment that comes into it and so on. And, and looking at, um, yeah, when are we doing what? And are we really just observing when we think we're just observing? Or is that having an effect already? Um, that's something that I find really fascinating and and i like to be as aware of as possible of yeah what's really happening thank you Lyo. and you're you're really making a very good um uh, awareness of the hawthorn effect i will come mm. back it's the fact that the observer has already an impact of yeah. on what happens yes mm. mm -hmm. right other examples how are you an anthropologist in your work i um 
can, I'm not sure if I understood the question, but I'll just answer intuitively. Uh, one thing I like to use is the, um, asking clients uh, their favorite uh, hero or heroine story. And um, often through relating that story, there is an element of past into present and really into future. Uh, and I don't know if that ties with anthropology because there's an element of history in it. Um, so that's something I, I love, and it really uh, gets the client to tap into uh, the strength point and their resources. And another thing I like to explore is uh, strokes, like the history of strokes and, and uh, people's uh, lives and childhood. You know, what was allowed, what was not allowed, what did they use, what did they have to give? That's also something I like to, to play around with and reveals a lot when you do that exercise with clients. I really like the fact that you're referring to um, to the narratives of storytelling, uh, Roya. I mean, Byrne wrote, I think, a lot of chapters on fairy tales and the importance of it. And, and not yeah. only, I mean, obviously more from the psychotherapeutic viewpoint. Huh? So what, what do we carry with that? But, but see how rich that, that in integrated narrative becomes huh? and maybe part of some script beliefs as well huh? and, and maybe some uh, unhelpful um, behaviors coming out of that. But this is so, so meaningful. Yes, the, the way we construct our narratives and, 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 and do so to give, to give meaning to the world and to, to ourselves, obviously, and to whatever happens to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's fascinating to read Burns' ideas on the fairy tales, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other parts, other things? I'm also thinking of interviews. I do a lot of interviews before I start uh, with, a, with a project. Uh, it's interviewing a representative uh, uh, group of people before maybe a change project. So I just want to have like a, a sort of cross cut of, of who will be involved in the project and, and what are the voices then uh, that we hear. So interviewing obviously is, a, is a informal or formal interviews. Sometimes you can get a lot, you can get, you know, a lot from just standing by the water cooler eh, or, the, or talking to the secretaries and, and learn from their narratives. Mm -hmm. Other techniques you use or inspirations? Um, I would like to agree with you that Ben was an anthropologist at heart, as well as a psychologist, and that he really set out to create a group, um, psycho psychological theory, social psychology theory. Um, so I've always been interested in working with groups, and in, for me, what's interesting from a sort of anthropological point of view is the individual's context and social map, if you like, whether that's through um, cultural scripting or questions that I might ask about their cultural being. And so that it's like the political and the personal are, are very interconnected for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Diane. Yes. Yes, I think there's a lot, a lot to discover in his work um, that touches upon. Um, yeah, he was he was a well-read man. I, 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 he, I think he read all the classics, you know, <laughs> in all kinds of fields, and and it, it permeates in his in his writings and and also in his in his body of work. Um, and um, I've been I've been more and more using that that viewpoint as well, you know, to the, to go to the psychodynamics in 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 my work. Uh, as I as I travel along uh, the TA knowledge and as I travel along all the articles that have been have been written and written and now a huge emphasis is also around the constructivist uh, approach in TA and which underlines again this this social reality shaping this co-creation of of uh, the intersubjectivity of doing it together I exist because you exist it's not so much more you and me uh, as separate entities or only in the interactions yes so um let me go to a uh, a model that i found useful i'm going to share my slides again and i use it for social uh, cultural change it is a anthropology model and it starts actually with the emic part so it starts in the left bottom 
It's yes, from the concrete level, but it has more uh, interest in the um, so it's the entry is on the emic level and the emic is really a word from that anthropology it is it's it's to sort of go native first so to say it's the participative observation first it's actually for me it signified slowing down sitting on my hands observing and not interacting it's much more about not doing and learning also what what appears when you're not doing than from really going to the interventions it's it's learning the cultural dna of the individuals in a group the language um it's it's listening and talking to to all people how how they um go about their activities what are their routines their habits and so many details are worthwhile noticing and and what I, I do this more and more, um, for instance, when I'm observing meetings, um, I learn a lot about an organization when I go to one of the signature meetings, I sit in the corner and I write and I write and I notice uh, what people are saying, I notice what their stories are and I, I can make then maybe some connections. But that's the second step, actually, that's the ethic part. So, whereas the emic level is is really concentrated on the individual the ethic part is the translation of your observations of of your uh, of your findings into a meaningful bigger picture so to speak it's it's this way that we go to a diagnosis and so we discover what is then hidden in the context of that individual in the system what's the link to the system so what are the parallels of interaction what do i see occurring more and more um no judgment no interventions yet but it is it's already how to say that making the tapestry of the of the of the stories into something comprehensible into something that links to the overall purpose of maybe uh, a department or a group so and this is very important in change projects by the way uh, when you want to realize the change it's to make it's to make all the emic stories of the individuals accessible to everybody who was not in the inner group. And this is often often a problem when you have change projects across different departments. It's that um, people don't seem to adhere so easily to the narratives of a certain other group because they are not a part of that group or not per se a, how to say that, um, a decision-making part of a group. And so it's every, every group has their own emic stories and how do I link them? into an ethic overall purpose and and bigger um bigger um uh, yeah bigger appearance so to say and and we need that before we can then go and see okay after that connection what is then the change that needs to happen so the that is really like then you go and and go to the contracting, then you go and fix it. Then you say, okay, so are we all in agreement then? If we have observed, if we have linked all those things, do we agree that this is probably a good next step? And what does that bring us? So what is the desired future then? What is then the outcome? And how is it different from what we have now? And um, then of course you can go to the last step eh? and you see it's a cycle. And that's realizing the change. So that is then only the intervention phase. It's to spread and to integrate or to assimilate a new narrative of change. And the big advantage of going into a cycle like this or a circle like this is that since you've been working with the emic stories, the adherence and the motivation and the, and the, the, the people saying, I agree, or I can see myself in it now, or, or I know that there is a spot for me, a place for me, is much bigger. The chances are bigger that people will engage because they felt that they've been listened to, that they've been talked to, they, they, they matter, they are part of the bigger picture, and then they are also having their voice in what needs to be changed. And maybe the interventions need then again to be uh, tweeted a bit, you know, you can do a recontracting, maybe get some more information from emic stories, see how they fit again into the ethic stories, and maybe just leave out a few of the emic stories as well that are not helpful or not appropriate with regard to the overall purpose. But it's the idea of incorporating them in, an, in a phase early enough um, than, than, um, than what we usually do in, in organizational work. 
Does that does that make sense to you all? Let me just quickly show this slide because I've been looking at, I had to look it up, I make an attic, by the way, it comes from from language words. Uh, it's so it's the basically Emic is, is again only in one culture and sometimes even one group member or individual. It's the micro stories and the ethic is then, okay, what's the micro story? How does the micro story fit into the macro story? And it's quite important to have that link because sometimes you have people who are for their maybe own individual agenda working in an organization. And then we have to check how does that micro story fit or doesn't fit in the bigger purpose of the organization or what the organization is looking out for uh, in their survival. So I hope this, this already makes it a little bit more comprehensible. And uh, I just want to stop sharing for a moment now and see um, if, that, if that makes sense to, to you guys. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And I also like the idea of the cycle, you know, that it's a, it's a, it's a reoccurrence. It's not finished, you know, uh, because we are obviously dynamic and organic creatures. So it starts again. Mm -hmm. Any questions so far, please, Roya? Um, uh, I just wonder if you have an example from your work to, to demonstrate it further. I'm not sure I get the full picture. Is this some, something from your work? Thank you. And I will share again to, to show you my next slide, because this also shows that I used to come in much more on the orange arrow, the, the, the determining the change. Um, um, I'm giving you, I'm going to give a, a little example that also illustrates the Hawthorne effect. I was asked by, a, by a, um, a department to look at their meeting hygiene, their meeting skills. They had loads of meetings and they weren't very efficient. And so they wanted to have another meeting culture. This was a, a, a government uh, institution uh, for housing, uh, new housings, uh, housing projects. And, um, and so the question was, give us a training, give us, you know, give us a few hours or a few days of training so that we can have better meeting skills. Now, in the past, I would have come in with determining the change. I would have, you know, talked to people but not in a not in an emic way or emic or ethic way. I would have you know go to the manager, the highest in rank maybe, or the one who was paying my bill, and asking, you know, okay, training. What do you want in that? And then it would be all very cognitive. Oh yes, and and you know, uh, give us some tools and and tips and tricks and theory, and then we can apply those. So. I could have seen that as the outcome. Uh, okay, that's the change that needs to be done because it's not efficient now. And then intervention, training, and then seeing, seeing what came out of that. But I realized that, mm, okay, I am not, I'm not going to the heart of the matter. Why is it exactly that those meetings are not so successful? So I turned it around and I stayed on the green, on the left of the green um, uh, line in the middle that you see. So I started to talk to people much more, took much more time to sit down with them and really ask, okay, what is your, what, how many meetings do you have? And what is your favorite meeting and why is that? And what's your least favorite meeting and why is that? And if you could decide, what would you change in the meeting? And I was just registering the, the input. And I, I talked to over 12 people, you know, I really took my time. And at one point, the manager said, yeah, but we want to have the training. And he said, but, well, I just want to talk to the people first. And then I also would like to observe two signature meetings that you have, two really important meetings. And I want to sit quietly in the, in the corner of the room. And then afterwards, we could share some feedback. And the manager was quite nervous, obviously, because it's sort of like it was an unusual request because they were very used to have people coming in and giving trainings or some consultancy, etc. But now I was also, and obviously this has to do a lot with the safety, you know, I had to, to go cautiously with also his emic story of what is his comfort in the meetings and what is his discomfort in the meetings. So his emic story was hugely important and I could sense how he was shaping my, um, he was before that also a bit shaping um, what he wanted from me. and. And especially my early years, I would have maybe complied much easier to that. But I told him, I'm not going to do any trainings before we have the occasion, you know, to talk together about it and go really in the undercurrents. And then also to see, to see, uh, to be a witness of your meetings. And it took me a little bit of convincing 
um, to be able to do so. I mean, you have to bear in mind that the work in organizations is often not a volunteering work. People often need to do things, need to come to trainings, need to maybe go into a team coaching. So it's very important to create enough safety and permission and commitment so that people open up and share things with you that otherwise they would maybe for good reasons keep hidden. So it's, 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 all, it's also working on a, a delicate balance of, of respecting the individual, the emic, but seeing always how it, is, how it is linked to the ethic, how it's linked to the purpose of the organization. So it's, 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 it's a complex navigation sometimes between the wants of a manager and the needs of the people that report to the manager eh, or that are dependent from, from him or her. And so, um, okay, I, I sat in the meeting and, and uh, wrote a lot of th stuff at two hours and then again two hours and, and I gave some immediate feedback, but very cautiously. And then I went again uh, into an emic and an ethic uh, exercise and talked about how was it for me when I sat there. And I got from, I don't know, maybe 75% or plus the, the remarks that, oh, you know, the president of the meeting was completely different now. You know, he was, oh, he noticed, you know, and he was much more cautious and he was actually so nice now. You see, so there was already this huge shift. And of course, you can debate whether they would really um, uh, repeat that again, you know, if I'm not there. But a learning had, had been done. There was already a transformation. There was a change. And, and it was also because I, I gave sufficient time to stay on the left side of this green line again and again and again so that people came to their own conclusions. Oh, right. So, so we sense now that he can do differently. And if we maybe invite him to change his narrative uh, and to change his way of behaving, we can maybe come closer to what is for all of us a more efficient and a more uh, appropriate uh, meeting. So, so this, is, this is a little example of, um, of what happened. Hold on, I'm just going to because I can't really see you well now. Yeah. So Roya, does that, does that explain it a bit better? Yeah. Um, well, the way I understand it is like, uh, basically start with a kind of gathering of information, being there, uh, living the experience that is. Yes. Before you can even begin to implement any change. So you have to be in the situation as it is now, living it, breathing it, thinking it. Yes, and, uh, and then from there move to to what what is wanted or needed. Yes, and I am not a therapist, and I, mm -hmm. I, I suspect in psychotherapy, obviously, there is a different pace. But if you look at at, at overall um, corporate interventions, are often asked, you know, on the content level, and they often mm -hmm. just stay there. I mean, yeah. I think also in the therapy level, like when you're working with someone, you need to start from where your client is, their reality. And, and understanding that before you can do anything else. Uh, so there is an element of really listening. Um, yeah, walking in their shoes or looking through their eyes, that sort of thing, uh, before you can, you know, support them or guide them to something different. Exactly. Yeah. This is this attunement huh, where Erskine mm -hmm. talks about huh, and yeah. other authors. Huh? It's this. It's this. It's just meeting them where they are. Yeah. And I mean, I can only. I mean, it's. Obviously, we all know this, but I found it very fascinating to see my own journey in that as well and my own change in that uh, throughout the years, you know, by learning more and more TA. I, I really became much more aware that these are um, significant little steps, you know, this and, and, and it takes, I mean, obviously, I lost a lot of clients, you know, and, and I had to learn to say no. Because so many managers or whomever leadership slots uh, or whatever, uh, so many um, uh, assignments that I got were, I just I said, no, we're not going to do that. If, 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 if there's no space for, for doing this in your team or with your team, I'm sorry, this is not my work anymore. So yeah, I, I, you know, my clientele shifted and is still shifting because of that, because of, of using this, this way of looking at them. Um, can I can I ask you know in the pandemic because everything got frozen, um, and I'm sure also in corporate uh, environments uh, where people were forced to just stand still and not do what they used to do, did that perhaps help them or force them to be in that 
left side, as you say, of the green the green um, vertical line. So they are being, listening, looking, seeing what things are, you know, as they are now. And that pose forced them to reflect and see different ways of doing things, which is now with a little bit past that lockdown period and it's people applying something different than the past. It's a good question. I've been I've been pondering about it, and I I, I cannot turn my head around it yet fully. Um, I I think it it can go both ways. I I've experienced managers who who yeah who became more reflexible, uh, reflexible, mm -hmm. yeah, increased and 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 more um, aware that they needed other find other ways of connecting. So so getting more in a different quality of contact, uh, relational mm -hmm. responsibility and contact. But I've also experienced um, a more of a distancing even more. Like it's easy, you know, to to be on a screen and to just give, you know, um, assignments and control differently and reportings and that's it. Mm -hmm. So I think there is like a there is a, a possible um, threat, you know, with the social media, so that it that it stays unidirectional. I mean, I I for one, I for one like to to sense the energy in the group like to sense you know how where do people sit uh, what do they do first how do they meet um where do they go to during the breaks so so i miss that dearly um mm -hmm. you know the yeah. of that so i i don't i didn't do much work anyway um uh, online I'm, I'm not so fond of doing online work and i do understand and completely respect that it is also a livelihood and that some people it was just not possible, you know, to 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 have a halt or to stop with with some of their activities. So it's um, yeah, it's interesting. I think what's what can help is to bring it into the equation. You know, how is it different and then start the investigation again and also going through what are you missing and what other anxieties are provoked. Um, with having to do it differently. I don't know if there's any experts here on, on virtual teams or um, online work, but you must have noticed what it means for you as well as a difference. And we all have our own ways of working and, and what we like. Um, yeah. So I, I personally, I, I am not in favor of it, of too much online work. And I, I really encourage teams to keep on visiting them, to keep on visiting uh, than live, but or to at least incorporate more, how to say that, personal self-disclosures and explorations um, to keep really in closer contact with each other and with the humanness of each of us. Yeah. So it takes more time, I think. Yeah. And you agree, Mary? <laughs> you want to share something from your from your practice? Yeah. No, I I, I do agree. I mean, I think with the virtual world. People are, well, I'm finding is they're being driven by these electronic diaries that everybody can see and has got access to. And I think there's almost a, they're triggered competitively to be seen to be busy. Mm. And so people are going from back one meeting to the next, to the next, to the next. And electronic diaries are dictating the duration of the meetings. So every meeting seems to be an hour, whether we actually need an hour or not, typically. So they're always an hour. Um, and there's no commute time, there's no, you know, driving or on the train or on the bus or even getting from walking from one room to the next. And I think it's very intense. So I'm constantly encouraging people to go for a walk outside in between meetings, at least get up, make a cup of tea or coffee or something, even just to get the circulation going physically. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's very intense and and I, I guess I'm quite surprised how people have allowed themselves to have that sort of agency taken away from them and and given it over to, as I see it, technology. Because we we can choose to do things differently. It doesn't have to be dictated by the electronic diary, which is what I kind of feel is happening at the moment. Mm -hmm. I like your I like your your comments, Mary, and I I think we have a huge um, uh, opportunity there, you know, to keep inviting them to do differently, and and uh, to to be at least more aware of of what is happening. And, and what I also learned is that the 
obviously the 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 example the role model of the leader uh, of the manager or whomever is in charge is so hugely important because that person is imitated that person is followed mm -hmm. and so if we make room for that person's um, already emic uh, stories and you know and and anxieties and sharing the vulnerability around all of that it can be followed and so yeah. it's it's an education uh, of those who lead first and 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 then this can be this can spread and i've seen the difference uh, really happening yeah mm -hmm. and i also agree it takes time i think it takes much more time than people appreciate i think for leaders much more of their time is probably needed in a virtual world in terms of communication and it has to be much more proactive as well you've got to get that time in somebody's diary and actively seek it you're not going to just accidentally bump into somebody on the way to the water cooler, et cetera, et cetera. So it has to be much more proactive and, and um, there needs to be a discipline around it. Yes, and it's, and it's, a, it's a challenge um, because first of all, uh, it, it, it also has a practical side, you know, the people come with a question and say, you need to, we only have so much, so many days and that's it. And then we need to see the result. And then you have to renegotiate really and recontract on mm -hmm. another moment, you see? And, and it's first, I mean, where, where does this assessment come from that it only takes that, that, that much time? You know, do you allow other people to also say something about how much time it will need? Mm -hmm. And there's mm -hmm. a whole different dialogue that just needs to occur. And, yeah. and it's a whole different, um, I mean, you know, I, now, now it's different, but I, I used not to getting paid for those interviews. You know, there was, oh, yeah, this is what you need. You know, this is just, it's, it's not important. You know, any consultant can come in and do a change project and doesn't need to interview. Sorry, you know, this one does. You see, so, so either I do it and not get paid or I do it and ask to be paid for it, for instance. So yeah. there's also this shift. You know, we should not be afraid of, of demanding that kind of shift. I think we, we are sustaining also what we don't want to see in the world. I'm doing that as well. And I need to be constantly reminded myself also, do differently, ask different questions, take different timings when you enter a project, for instance. Yeah. I was wondering if you noticed that there were particular sectors that were more receptive to your style of consulting or whether particular types of organizations Yes, I think I think the hardest the hardest work I have done was in family businesses, and there uh, obviously TA is very useful. Um, but there's often so many dynamics, and there's often so much uh, attached to the leadership slot, being founders or family members of founders, etc. So this is a huge other dynamic that then starts. Yeah, it's often it's often the bigger companies who have fundings, who have possibilities, who have a more longer time frame mm -hmm. also um, where you can where you can do more intermediate steps uh, and it's also obviously having a lot to do with is the DNA a learning organization yeah are they ready you know are they is it time to do things like that or not mm -hmm. or is it a long way I see yeah because I, I got thrown out as well you know many times you know like I mean yeah just being too quick being too 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 vulnerable for them coming too close you know uh oh okay so now we're going to do therapy therapy ha 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 you see mm -hmm. oh we're just gonna share what are your you know what is what are your tensions you know what is the, what's the anxiety huh, that you're feeling and what is the need underneath what you're just saying Ooh. so sometimes the closeness is different but generations yes. are changing mary and I experience many more younger people, they're open to psychological insights and sharing those kinds of things. And so I do believe in a revival of TA. Absolutely. Mm. Good. Yeah, I hope you also do. <laughs> yep. <laughs> anyway, I want to continue, please, because uh, it's, uh, I, I also want to go to, to the second model. Um, but I was just going to say, and I hope I answered your question, Roya, yeah, uh, sufficiently. Yeah, thank you. And so if there's no other question, okay, I just, I just leave it up to you to see how can you can play with the model. And you know, I, mean, I was, I was going to insert a little poll here, um, asking you what, what, 
what quadrant uh, or what position of the four do you see yourself maybe moving in a little bit more you know and it could be also the other way around i've known colleagues who just kept on talking <laughs> kept on exploring you know and okay let's do another interview oh and i need to gather some more information and let's and not going to the intervention so that's also obviously not helpful in the end you see it needs to be a balance but for me the balance is shifting much more to the first two than to the two second ones and it's sometimes against the current yeah so any more things about that or not okay i'm just going to i just lit i just did that little slide uh roya on the hawthorne effect yeah i've already talked about that huh so so it's it's interesting huh? the 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 hawthorne effect is is important obviously and it can also be a powerful uh, tool uh, at the same time so again this is about raising awareness and um, and also about incorporating enough safety uh, so that people don't see it as so that their vulnerability can be managed and and especially in groups uh, where it's sometimes more about image or, or how do others perceive me than uh, masks uh, like Roya said and uh, like how they how they show up okay so um i was gonna think of maybe a little break i don't know i let me let me just check how are you how are you at the moment do you guys need a little break or are you yeah i see john john would like a little coffee break good i agree shall we shall we take five is that enough for a coffee break yeah so let's come back at 17 past yeah thank you so much that there's a resistance is um, indicative of the thing that might need to change. Absolutely. It's the material again. Yes. Yeah. And then you have to see how far you can go with it. Yeah. 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 Which is which is not always uh, an easy feat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if, if, yeah, if people get through that, it's, it's great. It's, yeah, it's game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So welcome back, everybody. Thank you. Harpal, nice to meet you. I'm seeing you twice. Maybe that's not the idea. Um, um, yes, because I'm... Oh, hold on a minute. I thought that that would happen. So maybe you can... Yeah, I'm on the phone and... Oh, hold on. I don't know if you can hear me properly. Yeah, I'm on the phone and on my laptop because my laptop's a pain in the neck. So. It's nice to see people on the laptop, although I know you can't see me at the moment. So just in case one cuts out, I've got the other one. So Good. there's still 11 people. Thank okay. you. I can hear you clearly now. So, Thank uh, you. Yes. So we're going to start the second part with a little poll. Um, it's just a little thing to see that everybody's back after the break. And uh, please, uh, Kirsty, you can, yeah, you can launch it and you can answer. Only one question, only one answer, please. Single choice. Do you want me to read it out loud? No, I don't think so, huh? It might be useful. I'm not sure if it's visible on the screen for anyone watching the recording. 50% already answered. We need a few more answers. Please put in your vote now. It's the Dunbar number. Don't look it up, just answer quickly. <laughs> Come on, seven out of 10, eight out of 10, somebody else. Last chance to answer. We need two more people who answer. Maybe Harpal is, is counted twice. I don't know. We have eight answers now. Yeah, we need two more. Yeah, I've given my answer. Thank you. I don't seem to have the option of voting, I think, because I launched the poll. <laughs> okay, so then maybe that's it. Yeah. Did you vote, Andrew? Yeah. 
All right, everybody voted. Yeah, cool. So we can end the poll and see the results. Right, so if I can end the poll, yeah. Can you share, oh, we can, we will share the, yeah, sure. Can you all see the results now? Yes? Yes. You all think it's 75. This is interesting because there could be a cultural bias. Hmm? So if uh, we ask this, I mean, it is actually a Dunbar number, but the interpretation of it, you know, could be very culturally uh, uh, adjusted, obviously. And it is 150. Hmm. Dunbar's number, yes. So it's not 75, it's 150, apparently. So what does this mean? This means that um, it's it's the number, huh? well, obviously the the, answer, the the question said it, huh? With, with, with so many, we can maintain stable relationships. Now, obviously, and we will share the results for a moment. Can you see the results? 63% asked, seven, said 75, 25, 100, and none said 150. Yeah. So I would like you to, um, to ask to now to make your relationship circles. And by doing so, by taking a piece of paper, if you have something handy, a small, small sheet is enough. And by, hold on, I'm going to share with you the assignment. Um, that's the PowerPoint, yes. And that's the Dunbar, and that's the breakout. Okay. So take a piece of paper, only three minutes then. Huh? But. You don't have to do it now. Just maybe listen first, maybe to the assignment or to the to the question is to draw six concentric circles and to number them from zero to six and zero, the one in the middle, the most inner one is your own name. And then as you draw them, one is some persons that you would be able to call in the middle of the night for help to give your house keys to share your secrets with that you're not ashamed with when you are burping, being naked whatever. The, the second circle is the ones you would discuss a delicate issue with, or you would go on holidays with them, a few names maybe, to accept them. When you, people you accept unconditionally, and you can call upon them anytime. The third circle, more to the outward, is the ones you meet in your association. Maybe you have a longer chat with the baker, people you know and don't know. The fourth circle is the ones you would trust to get something in return. When you enter a plane, you are trusting the pilot to get you safely back and forth. A doctor, a nurse, maybe a politician, a teacher. And five is some people, and of course there you can't probably describe them with their names, but you could describe them when you see them. You could say how they look like or where they are at that moment or what do they do. So these are the these are the six concentric circles. And then I'd like you to go to the subgroup for 10 minutes, the breakout room, and to share maybe some numbers. If you were if you were answered 75, would you how would you distribute that 75? How would you distribute 150? Maybe more, maybe less. And can you see some similarities? And also I'd like you to also briefly talk about what makes people fit in in a circle? What's the core ingredient? And what needs to happen for people to move a circle or a boundary, obviously, up or down? You can make a screenshot of this or a photo with your, with your phone so that you can have this uh, maybe to remember um, when you go into your breakout room. Is there any more questions on this exercise? So are we doing the break of uh, this um, exercise in the breakout room or yes, you can, beforehand? Yes, you can, you can, uh, well, let's see. Um, or you can take a few minutes before you enter the breakout room and then you can uh, wait. No, no, let's do it more practical. Go into the breakout, do it for three minutes on your own, finish the circles and then you can share. Uh, for seven minutes. How's that sound, Harps? Could you say that one more time, sure. please? 
Yes, I think the best, the, the most convenient way is to go into the breakout rooms in a moment. Okay. That will be random with three people. And then there you take a few minutes. Doesn't need to be three, depends a bit. There you take first a few minutes to draw your own circles. And then when everybody's more or less ready, don't take too long, doesn't need to be complete. Then you can share in your group for at least uh, seven minutes then together. So in all, you will be 12, uh, 10, sorry, 10 minutes in the breakout room. Thank you very much. Is that okay? Is that okay for everybody? Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. And Kirsty will open the breakout rooms now. And I'm seeing everybody leaving Kirsty, so that's good. So it's only the two of us now. Welcome back, everybody. Ah, okay. I'm quite curious how that exercise went in your in your group. We cannot pick up from everybody, but maybe one person from each group can just briefly share something about how the exercise was and what did you find about the questions that were raised. Who wants to start? Roya, please. Well, we concluded that it's a very interesting exercise and you need a lot of time, <laughs> more than what we had. Um, when we started really getting into an interesting discussion, we were called back, but it, it is interesting reflective exercise. Um, and it can reveal something about you. You know, apart from, you know, how you relate, you know, who you trust, uh, that sort of thing. So we got to that sort of point um, and then we came back. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your frustration. <laughs> There's always that part. And it's an invitation to explore more, yeah, obviously. So hold on to that curiosity. Yes. Thank you. Something from the other group, groups. I think there were three or four groups. Huh? Yeah. Three groups. Sorry, Tim, to add one more thing to add is that it links also to culture. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. And you do, you do like, I'm not going into that because then we're off for an hour or so. Yes, yes, you're right. Of course, this is extremely important huh? because this is, again, how do we construct meaning, you know, and in the, think of that anthropology mindset again, huh? yeah, huh? in our specific culture or in this specific slice of a culture. Yes, thank you. Mary, you were going to share something? Well, yes. Um, I think there were certain themes like intimacy came up, um, masks was another theme, um, titles and, and relationships that went back to childhood when we didn't have titles and then how titles get in the way of perhaps intimacy and so therefore people might move out of circles one and two once we get titles in the mix as well. Um, I was with Johannes and Puya. So anybody in my team want to add anything to that? Please do so. Please do, yes. Puya agrees, Mary. Oh, good, excellent. <laughs> Yes, this is fascinating huh? how role shift also makes you maybe shift, you know, from one position to the other. It reminds me of this example, you know, for instance, uh, look at people sitting at a dentist, you know, uh, they are complete strangers when they come in. Uh, uh, one gets called by the dentist, uh, by the professional helper. So that person has to build another circle. And then maybe somebody gets unwell in that room, the waiting room. And then all of a sudden, there's a much more intimacy. So then people do things. And then what happens? And, and you see, so, uh, and obviously there's been a lot of psychological experiments around that as well. And, and it's, it's fascinating to see how we shift and what is the core ingredient of the shift. Trust is obviously very important, but so many other components can come into the mix. Yeah, thank you, Mary and that group. How about the third group? So then... Yeah, that was, that was us. <laughs> um, Andrew and Neil and I. 
And I think, gosh, we, we didn't have enough time either because first we were talking about the struggle to sort of like who fits in where. So one thing that we noticed is that people can shift between, between circles. Sometimes they're closer in and sometimes they're further out. And then, well, the hypothesis that we kind of were discussing was that, well, the, the number gets bigger um, the, the further you go out and it's almost like it's an exponential growth. But then we also questioned that, like, are there really so many people on that outside group? Because they're not people who are really present in our minds all the time. So do they belong there? Like the, someone I recognize in a supermarket, I would probably not be thinking of them at all until I by chance see them in the supermarket. So how, yeah, does that actually belong into my circle of relationships or not? And it was something that I actually found quite confusing. Thank you, Leo. And, and it, it, ties, it ties very well into what we've been discussing with virtual teams and social media. You know, mm. what does that mean, 10,000 likes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I have an idea about that, but we're not going <laughs> to. But I mean, yes, this is obviously. And the Dunbar number is just a number. You know, this is culturally so important as well. I mean, I attended, I attended a Turkish uh, wedding once and... Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, well, the, the, the family and the friends circle is much bigger than in my country, for instance, you know, mm -hmm. and in India, it's much bigger also. So and then they don't interact so much with all the acquaintances and, you know, professional mm -hmm. helpers until they really have to. But mm -hmm. tending to those first circles is so much more important. And the reciprocity, uh, a huge concept there, it's one of the social laws, is so important there. You know, mm -hmm. I scratch my, you scratch my, but I scratch your, you know, you do something for me in return. And so the laws of reciprocity are very important as well. And they determine often when you, can you stay in the circle or when do you get chucked out, for mm -hmm. instance. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much for, for all these comments. And let me go back to sharing the screen to show it to you in another way. And of course, we can make huge, huge uh, links to TA. We can see them from games. You know, maybe we don't play a third degree game with, you know, uh, with maybe more with family or friends or those close to us. And the first degree is maybe more out. We can we can make so many links with hungers, with with discounting, with games. Uh, like we said, I mean, there's a lot to put uh, together and. What also is maybe an interesting viewpoint is the time structuring, you know, the more strokes and the more intensity goes. Well, it's obviously the same with the relationship circles. So there's a lot of, of connections to be made between that model uh, and different concepts from TA. And I just want to point out that cohesion, obviously, is very important because that's also an indicator of when does a circle uh, stay or when can it maybe be broken. Uh, and I've just put a quote from Byrne there in, in, in what I think is his most his most best book. Huh? It's obviously the one from structures and dynamics of groups and organizations. I'm a huge fan of that book. And he already wrote there that, um, well, it's the need for the loyalty of the members. You know, it's the survival of the group. It is bound together, bound together by this loyalty, by this sense of you only belong if you adhere to some cult cultural norms, to some uh, habits, to some regulations uh, obviously huh? and and this is how also script comes in huh? and there maybe some group or organizational script comes in so how do we keep the group existing well it's because we need members to adjust to it there's always the tension between the individual and the the social uh, obviously and so th this this idea of 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 uh, reci uh, reciprocity is is very important and uh, it's also a concept that is important in anthropology, uh, uh, defined by three, three types of uh, reciprocity. Uh, it's the generalized one. Uh, so that is, um, uh, that's the one that where we just don't need anything back in, in, in return, uh, maybe an adult, adult transaction. There's the balanced one. Uh, so that's the enough giving and taking. Uh, so that's in an equilibrium. Uh, and there's the negative one that could be okay, not okay, or not okay, okay. And so that last one is often an issue in organizational, in teams work, as many of you can also, I guess, testify from your work. Um, I'm referring to maybe a team member who says, well, I do all the work and my coworkers are not putting in as much effort, etc., etc." 
But these are all very subjective concepts. Huh? When am I fully in balance with what I give in return to something else? Because resources are, are, are endless. And, and so it's, it's a very delicate um, thing to look at. And it's very important. And, and, and it's, a, it's a concept I use a lot in my work uh, when there is interconflict between, between members uh, in, in teams, for instance. And, and there's also um, some laws that could be defined around reciprocity. Like, for instance, pro-social cooperation. Reciprocity is very important for cooperation. Um, but there's also high anti-social punishment often with that. And that is then again the question of, oh, if you don't do what we think that needs to be done in this group, I'm going to chuck you out. So then the belonging you know, uh, is, in, is in question. Or then individual anxieties pop up again. And so this is a fundamental question of this tension between the individual attachment to a group and the social purpose that goes beyond the individual. And that is how much do I need to give up of my own identity to fit in a group and to stay into a group. And this is, this is a question I always have in the back of my mind when I do work in organizations. Um, and of course, the, the, the material of Eric uh, Byrne uh, with boundaries and the leadership slot and the membership slot is very useful uh, to keep determining and to keep defining what then exactly is the group. And I do the relationship exercise often with different departments to see how do they relate to each other? Do they still see the value chain throughout a whole corporation, for instance, or organization? Um, where are they seeing each other or not seeing each other? And, and why is it so difficult to accept the difference uh, of another department, for instance, sales against production or, or other things like that? And so, so it's, it's useful to bring, in, to bring in a humanistic part of it and to, and to then talk about what keeps them from uh, sharing. Um, and um, I want to make another little... Um, uh, and please raise your hands if you have any more questions. Huh? Otherwise, I want to share with you, and I'm going to put his article in the chat because it is permitted. Uh, I want to make a reference to an article from uh, Stephen Karpman from 2010. Well, obviously, this work for him is older, but this is the one that he, um, that he wrote. And he, he talked about intimacy scales and in uh, about uh, the pinwheel and this is quite interesting as well and it's a it's a way of it's a very easy way to 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 keep the topic flowing when you work with groups especially with people who are not so used to the ta jargon and what cartman says is that um and i've mapped it onto the relationship circles is that you can you can see a sort of an intimacy scale hmm? Um, zero, when there's silence, when people are not talking a lot huh, to themselves or to, uh, sorry, to the others, maybe they're talking to themselves, but not talking a lot to, to others. Huh? So it could be the withdrawing from time structure, but it could also be, well, I don't know these people yet. The imago has not yet formed. And so, mm. but when they start to talk about things, objects, places, obviously there's a reference to the, um, uh, to the, um, 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 Sorry, I'm looking for the, I'm, I know the Flemish word now, Tijdverdrijf, it's the, um, from the time structure, the second one, the... Past times. Yes. Is it past times? Oh, yes, past timing. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Obviously, you see there, eh? not that much intimacy. People, ideas, issues, interests, philosophy, a bit more intimacy already. Talking about me and you, and then talking about us. And then we come again to this intersubjectivity. Eh? Um, so listening very quietly in my corner, how does the conversation evolve, uh, evolve unfold uh, in meetings, for instance, I often use this little model uh, to see, okay, how are they and, and what do they consider and, and maybe what does it say about how they see each other in different groups uh, um, of relations. So, and, and Karpman in this, ex, in this article made wonderful case studies of it as well and how he used it to make individual clients move over towards more or less intimacy. And you can also uh, obviously do that in different ways of, of writing him down. And it's also an interesting exercise I just want to share with you, uh, which is useful to, uh, uh, for, for group analysis and for you know, getting to people to talk about Okay, how do we relate to each other and why aren't we yet at a sort of uh, level where we have this genuine contact? Huh? So what keeps us in the games and 
the games are often around the me, the you and the us, obviously, because the most strokes can be get from that, but also because there's the anxiety of revealing what's the need under the game. Hmm? Uh, my, my supervisor had a great quote on this. He said, when intimacy threatens, we can always play a game. And this is something I always keep in my mind as well. It's true, you know, when we, when we are, a game is like an awkward statement of a need. So um, I don't consider them that bad as, is, as, is, as they are usually looked upon. I consider them as awkward ways of asking for something. And then I'm getting curious on, okay. And then I try to make the Martian stand of, hey, what's underneath that? And what am I hearing? And what am I maybe not hearing? etc. And then the investigation can start. The other, the other uh, part in that article is his personality pinwheel. And it's also very funny. I like how Cartman just, you know, uh, goes with all his diagrams and his associations. And, and this, this one ties very nicely into the uh, functional ego states model. Obviously, uh, we talked about functional fluency already a little bit. Huh? Lyo mentioned that. And, and this is another way that Cartman devised to see, can we keep people into an okay, okay relationship? And I've also been, been experimenting with this and the relationship circles in the sense that what kind of okay interactions do I see now happening from the five uh, functional uh, uh, ego states? So is this positively huh, or negatively? And which wheel is turning the most? Okay, is it a nurturing parent? Oh, is that because the manager is the style? Or maybe a reaction against the negative a controlling parent of the manager, etc. Is there enough free child? What's missing here? So can we make the wheel turn? And then maybe I can find an exercise or a question or an interaction or an intervention that just makes the wheel turn again. Because Cartman see these as turning wheels. That's because of the little stripes at the side. And, and how then they they react to each other and i found some some very interesting um links of that also with what burn wrote uh, and i'm i'm going to i'm going to give a little quote um because burn uh, said uh, and let me just stop sharing so i can so you can all see me more yeah he just he said at one point in in his book from 61 that the non-existing theoretically perfect relationship is the one where all the nine vectors are open and where they are complementary. So you have to think about parent, parent, adult, adult, child, child, eh? and then the other ones. Where all nine are open and complementary. Six out of nine are necessary for any relationship. And so um, the goal is being admitted to and staying accepted in a specific relation. So this is again the relationship circle or the meaning making category. And so when then everybody is aligned, the imagos go well, etc. then the group can do the work activities, can become, you know, a working group. And so it's very in interesting to start to read what is the functional eco state DNA of a certain relationship circle? What is there exactly in common? And what is the core interaction image look like, so to say? And, and is that already um, for everybody agreed upon, huh? or are there still some issues and some fraction, uh, some frictions? And then you can sort of unpack by an analyzing the interactions on how does it work, how 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 does it how does it go? So um, yes, I'm I'm just gonna slowly close here, but I want to I want to ask how these two last things uh, speak to you. So I want to I want to see. How, yeah, please, uh, Roya. Yeah. Well, I was just uh, reflecting on the definition of a relationship and whether there is a relationship with a person who's not present. Can you say some more the relationship with the person? Well, I'm, I'm thinking, and uh, like if I think of an organization, perhaps the what, what did the burn call it? The, um, absent leader, the person who founded something and is no longer alive. Yes. Um, in terms of, of, of organizations. Can you hear me? The line is breaking up a bit, I think. Yes. Uh, and then I'm also thinking in families, you know, where, where there are feuds and you're not necessarily interacting, let's say, with the parent figure, yet they affect 
dynamics and transactions, but they're not, you know, it's not a day-to-day -day interaction with them. Thank you for mentioning that, uh, Raoya, because obviously those ghosts are very important. And I think it was Mazzetti who wrote an interesting article uh, on that and how they, how they appear also, obviously, in organizations. The founder might be maybe long dead, just like mm -hmm. Eric Byrne, but we still adhere to all of his thinking and to, to all of his ways and all of his interactions. They get, they get handed down, yes, and, and culturally uh, enshrined into our behaviors. So this is also very important to look into the history. And this is again where anthropology can be so of use. You know, look at the history, look at the narratives, the, the ancient wisdoms, the, 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 the things that got forgotten. I mean, this is one of the things I, I look up first. I go and see the yearbooks, the, the annual reportings, not the yearbooks, that's from high school, but the annual reportings of, of uh, corporations to see the history, how was it founded, and, and to also deduct from there already parts. Um, yeah, it ties in with also the, the diagnosis of burn, huh? the historical diagnosis, you know, apart from the, the obviously the interactions and uh, the social uh, and the other forms of diagnosis. Context drill one is very important as well. So yes, huge roles in, in, in still being in the relationship circle, I guess, mm -hmm. definitely. Think of family members. It's very, yeah, mm -hmm. very apparent. Please, um, other remarks? How does this speak to you? Oh, some people are writing, some people are. Um, any more questions on that? Of course, the, of course, I will send the slides. Yeah, mm -hmm, I'll make them available, like I agreed. I also put the article of Cartman in the chat. It is. Uh, it's. It's okay for to distribute that. Yeah, I was. Thinking I saw. Sorry, Tim. Just a question. I saw that you put the article in the chat, and I was just trying to download it, but it doesn't work. Is there a trick that we need to know in order to be able to do that? Well, the trick will be that I send it together with the slides. Is that okay? Ah, yes, that would be great. <laughs> some download it. Some can't. It, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But first of all, before we before we go slowly to a close, because I do want to honor the time, um, can you see some 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 things uh, that you can that you can take away from this? Um, I have written some conclusions, uh, but I am I'm, I'm much more interested in hearing yours. So uh, I would like to to finish off the last the last minutes uh, with asking. Are you inspired by, by the anthropologist lens and, and to see some linking with TA? And most of all, do you get some more yummy yummy to, to start exploring more for yourselves? Um, so please, I would like to hear from you guys. Yes, I am. I, just, that I found the first part much more interesting and useful for me. I like the first diagram and the um, notion of immersing oneself more first before drawing out uh, conclusions of a more generalized nature. So that, that for me was the most useful and interesting part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Mm -hmm. I like the, the concept of the, the Hawthorne effect, mm -hmm. that uh, once you start sort of observing or, or being in a system, you change it almost inevitably. And so even the like when we think that we, we're not creating change, we are creating change. Yes, and how can you use that knowledge mm. and not be afraid of it, you know, but see the emerging reality then again and, and mm. ask about it in the here and now. Yeah, great. Thank you, Neil. But I, I like it also because it comes from quantum mechanics, which is also about sort of uncertainty and also measuring things on a molecular small level. Definitely. You know, yeah. Yes, with all the particles changing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't, yeah I'm not thank a you. Specialist. This is this is to be still discovered, I guess, huh? in our natural sciences. Huh? Yeah, yes. yeah. Great. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Some other reactions? I liked the concept of the emic and the etic and thinking about that in relation to change 
and how I might use that with some of the people I'm coaching now. Um, I think intuitively I've been aware of it, but actually just having those concepts to relate to is very helpful. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Good luck, Mary. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> They're always in the background, even the ethics. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. And language is an important part of that also. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But I guess it's getting the micro level and then thinking about the macro. And so often senior leaders are very much about what's impacting on them and forget about at a macro level, how does this translate across the wider organization? And, um, and then they lose people and wonder why. And that's like, wonder why, mm -hmm. wonder why people don't connect huh, to the yes. purpose. Yes, because they don't feel they belong to it. There's no space for that. No, they haven't been involved. Mm -hmm. Great point. Thank you. Thank you, Harps, for the thumbs up. Anybody else wants to share? Lyo? Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm quite inspired by the relationship circle exercise because I think it's such a reminder of how many people we actually are connected to um, and like on, on many different levels, but it's sort of this reach that goes out, 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 out. And it up until we realize actually we are probably in some way connected to everybody else on this earth. So then it becomes a bit philosophical, but from that perception of, okay, we're on our own little island doing our own little thing to realizing the reach is so much bigger and could go on, yeah, limitless. Lovely, Alayo. And uh, it again ties to this universality huh, of man. Mm. Yeah. Oh. yeah. All and people know deep down that we share this common thing, you know, we just yeah. seem to forget it so easily. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's rebuild that kind of basic encounter. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's really inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lyle. Roya, would you like to? Yeah, I'm uh, very much intrigued by the relationship uh, circles. Definitely will uh, work more on that. And I'm intrigued by its connection to roles and when your role changes, how that impacts certain relationships. I was shocked by the 150 number, the dumbbell number. I, I was thinking way lower than that. So it, it really surprised me. And then I also am wondering with, you know, life being a lot online now, how is that impacted? Um, I was thinking like in the past, you used to have what we call pen pals. You would be very close to somebody that you've never met. And in some way online, you, are, you can be close to someone that you haven't met except on the screen. Is that a relationship? Would you share secrets with this person? How, how, how does this technology influencing relationship circles? Beautiful. And, and I think this digital revolution um, uh, makes it so necessary to do this kind of research because we haven't seen you know, all the consequences yet. And, yeah. and they are far more deeper, I think, than we at first uh, see or, or admit yeah, mm -hmm. and, and like in any revolution there's always casualties huh <laughs> there's always things you know that fit and that don't fit so what do we make from that great questions yes so thank you all thank you all I hope I hope to have been showing a little bit of inspiration from uh, from two worlds that are so similar in a way and I wish you all the best of luck with applying or playing with it, with exploring more. If there is any questions or whatsoever, you can reach me through uh, SATA, of course. Huh? Do, they all have my, um, my, um, my contacts. And I was, I was, it was really a pleasure for me to have been meeting you guys and to have been able to, to make this little uh, excursion into, into some themes. So thank you again very much and looking forward to meet you live I don't know when, don't know why, uh, don't know where, but I hope it will happen. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Tim. Bye. Thank Thanks you. So much. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. We have to stop the recording, I think. Yes. <laughs>